by Ricardo Penco on uh, effective field theories for particle physics uh, and beyond. So, Ricardo, please, we will do as usual. So if you guys have questions, just write them in the chat. Uh, we'll collect a few of them and then interrupt Ricardo. Uh, can you make me again a uh, co-host? Uh, oh, yeah, I, sure, sure. I logged out for a moment and now. Here you are. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Um, all right, so um, before jumping right in, um, I just wanted to um, uh, come back for a moment to a question that was asked during the Q&A about uh, one of the exercises on how to calculate uh, uh, one loop corrections to the cosmological constant. And uh, I felt like I did a, a very poor job, poor job at answering that question, uh, partly because I didn't have my cable to connect my iPad and I was trying to explain things just uh, with words, uh, whereas I should have just uh, written down a, a diagram in the, um, on the iPad. So now that I have my cable and I can connect the iPad, let me just uh, uh, follow up for a moment on that. Uh, uh, so this is an exercise at the end of, uh, of section two. Uh, and uh, the, the, the premise is you want to start with uh, uh, just, uh, say, a free scalar field. That's what it means to have the Higgs at lowest order in all the couplings, so neglecting all the interactions. Take a free scalar and try to calculate what would be the contribution of that to uh, at one loop to the cosmological constant. Okay. And so uh, uh, one way of thinking about that uh, which, uh, as John suggested, is uh, you can take your action and uh, couple it to a, a, a curve metric, which then you expand around the Minkowski metric in this form. Right? And then, by definition, uh, your action, when you expand it in power of h, it's going to contain, uh, uh, among other things, uh, it's going to contain a piece linear in H menu and uh, up to factors of two. Uh, the coefficient, uh, anything that multiplies the piece linear in H menu is the stress energy tensor. Okay. So now uh, the cosmological constant is uh, uh, proportional to the piece that is constant in the stress energy tensor. And then of course, if you have a, a free scalar, you're going to have things like d mu phi, d mu phi, plus things like eta mu nu schematically, uh, m squared, phi squared, uh, plus uh, box, uh, sorry, plus uh, d phi squared and so on, okay? Very good. Uh, and so when uh, you're asked to calculate the one loop correction to the cosmological constant, you really wanna calculate a one loop diagram that gives you a term linear in h times a constant. And so if you pick this h here and say this piece in the stress energy tensor, you're left with a, a, a trilinear coupling of this form. And uh, uh, if you use this coupling to calculate this loop, this loop is going to give uh, a one loop correction to the piece linear in h times a constant. And because the couplings between h and phi involve derivatives, if you write it down explicitly, schematically it goes like d for k, the momentum in the loop, k squared over plus possibly some numbers times m squared, plus k squared plus m squared. Right? So this uh, uh, um, uh, integral has mass dimension four, it's UV divergent. In dimensional regularization, it must be proportional to the only scale in the integral, and therefore it must scale like m to the fourth, the mass of the particle. Okay. Uh, so I think it was the two Lucases that asked this question before. I hope this uh, answered it a little better than, uh, than I did before. Uh, if not, just uh, maybe uh, feel free to follow up uh, uh, in the chat, but we can uh, uh, for now move on with the content of the lecture. And I'm happy to address it either at the very end of the lecture or, or on Slack or by email, whatever you prefer. Okay, very good. So now let's uh, uh, jump right in and uh, continue with our discussion of uh, non-relativistic fermions. 
So just a quick recap, if you remember last time, we uh, started from a relativistic theory of self-interacting fermions, and we showed how you can uh, match that at, at, or switch from that theory onto an effective theory that is valid at small velocities compared to the speed of light, which involves only a two-spinner, okay? So a non-relativistic two-spinner. I'm sh showing here the first few terms in this effective action. And we said the expansion parameter is either P over MC or V over C. And something else that we discussed is how the various symmetries uh, uh, of this action act on the field psi. So we have, of course, uh, spatial translations and also time translations. We have spatial rotations. Galilean boost, uh, I don't think I wrote the exact transformation rule last time, but uh, because uh, uh, if you remember, uh, this non-relativistic fermion, this non-relativistic spinor was obtained after uh, a rephasing. And uh, the rephasing was crucial because we were working we we're working now in a kinematic regime where our particles are non-relativistic. When you take into account how that phase transforms, uh, it transforms in such a way that uh, uh, under Galilei boost, uh, the, the field gets rephased in this form. And then of course we have particle number and, and spin rotations, okay? So uh, what we saw last time was that uh, for uh, non-relativistic fermions in vacuum, um, that there are no uh, relevant uh, or even marginal interactions that we can write, all interactions are, are non-normalizable. And what we will do today is uh, we'll see how uh, this power counting changes if uh, instead, uh, in, two, in two cases, one, if instead of being in the vacuum, we are at finite density, and we can do that by adding an extra term to the Lagrangian of this form, where uh, the coefficient mu, as we discussed last time at the end of the lecture, is the chemical potential associated with this uh, uh, finite uh, U1 charge density. Okay, so this is the, the U1 we're gonna put uh, uh, at finite density. So this is the first thing we, we're gonna discuss. And the second, uh, instead, example that we're gonna give is one where uh, the quartic self-interaction, a contact interaction, is replaced by uh, a long range electromagnetic interactions. Okay. And so these uh, uh, two examples will essentially highlight uh, the importance of thinking of expansion parameters as the third defining ingredient of our effective theory. Because uh, uh, the two examples we'll discuss today will have exactly the same particle content and non-relativistic fermions. Uh, well, in this case, I guess they will also, we will also have the, um, uh, the photon, but the first one is going to have exactly the same particle content. It's going to have the same symmetries. The only difference is going to be that uh, we'll be in a different kinematic regime. And so the power counting will be different and this will give rise to a different type of effective theory. So these are also interesting examples. Uh, and I chose them because it will allow us again uh, to uh, really see at play this uh, trick that we introduced last time of rephasing the fields whenever, whenever you are in a kinematic regime where derivatives scale in a funny way. And we'll take this one step further uh, in the second example by also discussing uh, the method of regions. Okay. So, Let's, uh, let's dive right in and let's start talking about what happens at finite density. And this is, if you want, uh, the uh, beyond part of these lectures, okay? Because uh, considering non-relativistic fermions at finite density is something that uh, 
usually a condensed matter physicist is more likely to consider than uh, say a particle physicist. But I hope this will show you how this whole uh, EFT ideology doesn't know any boundaries and applies also outside of particle physics to any problem in physics. Okay. So by turning on a chemical potential, mu n of r, which uh, by definition, uh, um, since it's a non-relativistic chemical potential, it means that it must be much smaller than the rest energy of, uh, of the fermions. What we're doing is we're introducing a new scale in the problem. And uh, as you might know from uh, your uh, uh, statistical uh, mechanics courses, uh, the ground state for, for such a system at finite density, if the particles are fermions, uh, is a state in which uh, all the fermion states uh, are uh, uh, with energy less or equal than mu uh, and r, which I'm also going to refer to as the Fermi energy. All the states are filled and all other uh, states are uh, unoccupied. Okay. So the simplest example of this, uh, which is an example that usually one encounters in a start my course is the example of free fermions, in which case uh, uh, the energy is just p squared over 2m in the absence of any other interactions. And so all uh, uh, the occupied states can be represented as a sphere in momentum space with a radius uh, pf equal to the Fermi momentum given by 2m ef, the Fermi energy. Okay. So this is what it means to say that uh, all states uh, with energy less uh, than the, the Fermi energy are occupied. It means that all the states that live inside the sphere are, are filled and all the states that live outside uh, are, are empty. Okay, so this is how the ground state looks like for uh, uh, for free fermions. Now, in the presence of interactions, the relation between PF and EF can become more complicated. So, in general, it's going to be some function of PF. And uh, um, what I'm going to say uh, today, the precise form of this function is, will not really be important. In fact, uh, so when uh, you are considering fermions, say, not just uh, uh, by themselves, but for instance, in a metal, and these fermions also interact with the underlying lattice, then uh, the Fermi surface, which is in this case, in this simple example, was the boundary of the sphere, then the Fermi surface can actually acquire more complicated shapes and can be an isotropic right, because the underlying lattice picks uh, preferred directions. However, for now, we're just going to consider fermions by themselves, and therefore, by isotropy, our Fermi surface uh, will be uh, spherical, even though, um, like I said, the relation between uh, its radius and the Fermi energy might be, uh, might be complicated, okay? So what are the low energy excitations of this system? Imagine that we're interested in a low energy effective theory for, for the system. Well, uh, low energy excitations can correspond to taking an electron from at or right below the Fermi surface and moving it slightly above the Fermi surface. Okay. So this is certainly uh, um, at least a picture that uh, uh, intuitively makes sense uh, if uh, the fermions are weakly coupled, in which case uh, it is clear that your fermions are still going to be the relevant degrees of freedom, but perhaps you know they're going to be dressed uh, by uh, by interactions. So their energy is going to be slightly modified by interactions and so on. Now, in strongly coupled uh, systems, instead, uh, if these fermions are strongly coupled, it is not clear a priori what should be the nature of uh, um, uh, of low energy excitation, right? Things, for instance, of, of QCD, 
uh, where the quarks are strongly coupled. And uh, we saw over the last few lectures that uh, at the low energy excitations are just uh, scalar mesons, right? So, and they are not degrees of freedom that were originally in the Lagrangian. So for strongly coupled uh, non-relativistic fermions, what should be the degrees of freedom? Well, at that point, uh, uh, here we don't have, uh, uh, we cannot be guided by symmetries in the same way that we were guided in chiral perturbation theory. And therefore the particle content is, uh, um, is essentially a, an input. And uh, one common assumption, which essentially defines what is known as Fermi liquid theory, um, assumes that even in strongly coupled systems, uh, the low energy excitations are still fermions. And these uh, excitations are often referred to as quasi particles. Just to avoid any confusions between them and uh, the underlying fermions that make up your system. Okay. So these quasi particles are not in strong carbon system, the original fermions, nevertheless, Fermi liquid theory assumes that they remain, remain they are also fermions. And uh, it turns out that this assumption is, uh, is remarkably uh, successful in that it describes many systems uh, um, in nature, okay? So this specifies the field content. Now the symmetries remain essentially the same as the symmetries of fermions in vacuum. So um, translations, rotations, spin rotations, boosts, and uh, U1 symmetry. Now, uh, however, we would like to um, figure out what the correct expansion parameter is in this case. And so we're interested in essentially excitations that have, uh, uh, um, that are slightly above the Fermi energy, okay? So in the weekly couple, Called, uh, case, uh, you can visualize this and you can imagine this fermion as having an energy which is uh, e, EF plus epsilon, okay? And so uh, in, uh, in, generally, we, in general, we'll be interested in small collective excitation of this system that uh, uh, add, when present, add to the uh, system an energy epsilon, which is much smaller than the Fermi energy. And therefore, a good, uh, uh, a natural definition for our expansion parameter is the ratio of these small energies over the Fermi energy. Okay. So you can ask, uh, we can now start uh, power counting and ask ourselves how do uh, fields uh, and their derivatives scale with this expansion parameter. In particular, let's take the original fermions that make up the system. How do their derivatives scale? Well, uh, since uh, uh, so the, the the excitations are presumably uh, um, can be thought of as the collective uh, cooperation of fermions that live uh, near the Fermi surface, because it would cost a lot of energy to excite uh, a state, uh, a fermion that is very deep in the Fermi surface. Derivatives on the original fermions uh, will scale essentially like the Fermi energy and the Fermi momentum. And therefore, will not scale with epsilon. So this is very similar to what we saw when we went from uh, uh, a relativistic fermion, uh, for, for, from a Dirac spin or sorry, in the non-relativistic limit uh, where the energy was dominated by the rest mass energy and didn't scale with the momentum. Uh, here we have a similar problem, except that now both the energy and the momentum do not scale with epsilon. But now, in light of what we saw uh, 
at the end of the last lecture, we know an easy way uh, to solve this problem, which is a rephasing, right? So we go from our two spin or psi of t and x, and we extract a fast phase that depends on the Fermi energy. But now we also need to discuss, the, to extract a, a fast momentum, the, the Fermi momentum. And in fact, uh, this momentum is gonna differ depending on uh, which point on the surface, on the Fermi surface you're interested in. And so to take care of that, what one does is trade uh, Psi, the single field Psi, for uh, a collection of fields la labeled by the momentum PF for uh, one for each point on the Fermi surface. And then from each of these fields, extract the fast phase so that eventually uh, Psi, these Psi's of, of PF only contain uh, slow, uh, momenta, low momenta, and, uh, and, and small energies. Okay. So now in particular, dt of uh, uh, psi of pf is going to scale like i epsilon psi tf, exactly as uh, when we rephased the, the Dirac field to produce a, a non-relativistic field, we went from having a time derivative that scale like mc squared to having a time derivative, a time derivative that scale like the non-relativistic energy p squared over 2m, which would be the next, uh, the subdominant term in an expansion of the energy in powers of t. And this is exactly the same. I'll come back in a moment to how special derivatives scale. Uh, but for now, before doing that, let me uh, briefly discuss how the symmetries acting on Psi translate to the symmetries acting on these new fields uh, Psi of, of PF. Okay. So we have time translation. Now Psi prime of PF of T plus C. And x will be equal to e to i e f c psi p f t and x. We have uh, spatial translations. So we're not used to thinking uh, usually, unless you have already seen this type of construction. So as um, about fields that are labeled by some momenta. Uh, and so we are not used to these types of uh, transformation, say, under special translations. And that's the reason why I'm, uh, um, I'm being a little pedantic and, uh, and, and spelling them down, okay? Um, I'm gonna skip rotations just for the sake of time because it's not really gonna play a role in uh, what we're gonna uh, discuss today. The transformation properties under boost, now not surprisingly relate uh, fields with different labels, okay? So you can think of these exactly as uh, um, you know, if you had a vector where the label now is just a, a, a discrete label, uh, runs one, two, three, if it's a vector in three dimension, rotations are going to mix uh, different components. Similarly here, boosts mix similar components. If you take uh, PF as being the, the label that denotes the various components of these fields. And finally, spin rotations, act exactly as you would expect, meaning they act as some SU2 matrix on uh, 
the spinor indices of these fermion fields, okay? So in probably all, almost all the time today, I'm just going to suppress the spinor indices, but you need to think of them as, as being there. These are uh, two dimensional spinors. So in order to preserve spin symmetries, we're gonna have to contract all the indices. So if the fermions that are at finite density are strongly coupled, we cannot carry out a, a matching uh, procedure um, explicitly perturbatively as we, did, as we did in the simple case with the, um, with the, with the quartic self-interaction, okay? And so we need to take uh, uh, symmetries as our guiding principle and write down everything that, uh, that is allowed by them given the particle content. So in order to do that, uh, it is convenient to introduce one more quantity, which is known as the Fermi velocity. Okay. This is some structure that we have that we inherit because of the presence of a Fermi surface. And uh, essentially tells us how the Fermi energy changes if you change uh, the Fermi momentum. And we said that for strongly coupled systems, EF is an arbitrary function. And uh, one property of this arbitrary function is uh, the, the first derivative with respect to PF. So this is a convenient quantity to define because uh, if you take now your, uh, um, your uh, finite density system and you boost it, not surprisingly, given the name, the Fermi velocity transforms as VF goes to minus V, where V is the velocity of the now, the, the boosted frame. And uh, the reason why it's uh, useful to introduce the Fermi velocity in this context is because it allows us to define uh, um, a differential operator, which is the combination of dt and vf dotted with the gradient, which uh, uh, is invariant under, uh, under boost. Okay. So this is precisely, if you want, the analog of this combination here in vacuum, except that now you see that uh, when uh, uh, we are not in vacuum, we can use VF to build this operator. And, uh, and therefore, the, the, when we are gonna use this operator to write down in a moment, the leading kinetic term, turns out that the leading kinetic term will contain only one special derivative rather than two as in vacuum. And because of that, the, the power counting will change. And as you will see, the physics will, will, will change significantly. Okay. So let me write down then the, uh, the leading kinetic term given our field content symmetries and given this differential operator. And uh, we're simply gonna sum over all the, all the labels for our fields. And then we're gonna have a derivative of this form and a, a usual bilinear in the fields. And now you can check going back to these uh, transformation properties that uh, the fact that uh, we have a Psi and a Psi dagger means that uh, this phase here that would appear in time translations will cancel out. So this Lagrangian is invariant under time translations. Uh, same thing goes for uh, um, for uh, um, spatial translations. Now, um, as we'll see in a moment, when we include uh, more than two fields, then uh, transformations under spatial translation will actually give uh, a, an interesting constraint on the terms that we can write down. We said that D is invariant under uh, boosts, and as long as the spinor indices here are all contracted, this uh, kinetic term is indeed invariant under all our symmetries. So before proceeding with the, with the power counting, since uh, I don't know how many of you have seen these type of tricks where you trade, uh, not just you rephrase the field, but you actually trade the field for a collection of them that is labeled, uh, that are labeled by some hard momenta. Uh, let me take just a, a, a moment of pause and see if you have any questions about this. So Ricardo, there are no questions. There is a remark by Boris on which maybe you want to 
to comment. He's saying, okay. unfortunately, at finite density, it is often not possible to formulate a consistent power counting, for example, for nuclear matter. Um, so I don't know if uh, uh, you're thinking about uh, uh, relativistic systems, Boris. Um, in which case that wouldn't really apply to what I'm discussing here. Boris, we oh. cannot hear you. You need to turn on the, the microphone. Oh. Yeah. Can, yeah. Hi, Boris. Hi. I'm talking about ordinary matter, ordinary nuclear matter, where you can't really uh, formulate consistent counting. Like if you take ring diagram or parquet diagram or simple heart refoc, you, you don't really have a mean to say why first is larger than the second one. And this is the long-standing problem in, in nuclear matter, unfortunately. Also, well, uh -huh. Also, you can't uh, formulate consistent counting for nuclear and nuclear interaction. There you have to uh, use non-perturbative uh, prescription, like Weinberg prescription or something like that. And counting is formulated for potential, which is not an observable. And this is a big problem in nuclear physics. What you're talking about is kind of counting for uh, Fermi liquid, which is perfectly fine, but unfortunately, it's hardly applicable to nuclear matter. No, no, that's right. But so I don't know, maybe when 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 uh, you logged in, but in fact, I started by saying that this part of the lecture is going to be the beyond part of the lecture compared to particle physics, yeah. meaning that this is certainly a context that is maybe more relevant for condensed matter. Uh, yeah. In condensed matter, you sometimes can do that because there is a natural scale there. Mm -hmm. You can do that. You can also do that for dilute system where you've got effective expansion parameter like scattering length times uh, P Fermi. Mm -hmm. If this is much less than zero, you can formulate uh, effective field theory expansion. But the, uh, these are exceptions. For nuclear matter at saturation, unfortunately, nobody came up with uh, consistent yeah. counting as yet. Yeah, so I haven't thought much. I never worked on, uh, on you know, nuclear matter at finite density. So I haven't thought much about that. Um, but yeah. uh, maybe one thing I can add is that the second example that I'll discuss today will uh, be an example of a situation where coming up with uh, uh, a well-defined power counting is actually, you know, very difficult, require you to jump through a lot of hoops. Oh, yes. And so even in systems like the one you're referring to, which I'm not familiar with, but uh, where you're saying uh, no one has been able to find a consistent power counting yet, uh, oh. there might be still hope. It's just that maybe uh, figuring it out is, is, very, is very complicated. It's and very so... complicated. And the main reason is that uh, Fermi momenta, which is 250 MeV, which is intermediate scale, it's larger than pi and mm -hmm. But it's smaller than nuclear mass. So how to to kind of treat this? So yeah. it's not easy. There are lots of work on that, and still uh, we're not there yet. But I mean, sorry for interruption. So no, no, thank you. Oh, thank you. That's this. all right, Boris. So maybe maybe at the end of the lecture, if you still have yeah. some comments or or if you want to discuss more, please uh, absolutely let, let me stick know. Around. At, uh, yes, we can we can continue the discussion. Thanks um, a lot. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So Ricardo, we have uh, three questions which I think are quick so maybe yeah, sure. we can uh, we can go over them so Francesca is asking isn't this trading of fields just a discrete Fourier transformation uh, in a sense if you want because uh, uh, it, it's a partial Fourier transformation in the sense that uh, this psi of pf still depend on uh, on can still be transformed, uh, Fourier transformed, uh, but uh, uh, they only contain uh, long wavelength momenta. So if you want the momentum of the psi here has been decomposed into a fast part, which is PF and, uh, uh, and uh, a, a slow part, 
that uh, that is the momentum that is still containing this psi apps. And I've only, if you want, uh, Fourier transform with respect to the, the fast components. That's that's one way of looking at it. Yeah. So one more question from Guilherme. So Guilherme is asking, say we have n fermions in this finite density system. This collection of fields associated with the momentum PF represents the degree of freedom, the degrees of freedom of the n fermions. Uh, no, so, um, okay, so there are a few things I wanna say. So first of all, the fact that we are working at the fixed chemical potential means that uh, we are uh, not in an example, in an ensemble where uh, the number of particles is, is fixed, uh, but the number of particles is, is allowed to fluctuate. That's uh, the, the first question, the, the first, uh, uh, point I want to make. The second point is that, uh, uh, yeah, so it's not that we're introducing one fermion field for each particle in this uh, in collection um, of, of uh, in this finite density system. Uh, as I uh, mentioned in, by answering the previous uh, question, we are essentially, if you want, performing a sort of partial Fourier transform. That's a better way of looking at it. So we have a last question from Sudipta. So he's asking, why the time derivative on the wave function gives uh, uh, i times epsilon times the wave function? Can you explain again? Uh, because uh, uh, you see, if you remember uh, what we did uh, um, for the, uh, in going from a relativistic to a non-relativistic fermion in vacuum, we had, uh, uh, we extracted a phase of this form and introduced a psi tilde because uh, for non-relativistic uh, uh, particles, the, the, the time derivative uh, uh, acting on the psi would have scaled like uh, the energy, which is dominated by the rest energy. MC squared. Yeah. Uh, sorry, without tilde. And so by extracting this, this fast, fast phase, when the derivative now acts on psi tilde, uh, it's gonna pick up two pieces, one where the derivative hits the phase, one where it hits psi, and the, the contribution coming from the, from the phase cancels the rest energy and uh, uh, it leaves you with the subdominant piece in the energy, which is p squared over 2m. Okay. So now the situation here is very similar. We're interested in uh, excitations that uh, with respect to the vacuum, if you want, have an energy that is uh, slightly above uh, uh, the Fermi energy. And we are extracting, we are rephasing the Fermi energy exactly as we extracted mc squared here. So that now when uh, the time derivative acts on these new fields, uh, what we pick up is the subleading term, which is the epsilon. Okay. And I'm focusing on excitations that have small energies above the Fermi surface because I'm interested in the low energy excitations above this ground state, uh, which corresponds to this Fermi uh, sphere that is filled. Okay, so for the moment, there are no further questions, Ricardo. Okay, so then let me let me proceed. Um, very good, so let's start with uh, a little bit of, uh, of power counting here. We said that this uh, operator D uh, has the property that is invariant under boost, and uh, therefore to preserve boost and have a self-consistent power counting, it better be the case that Vf scales uh, uh, times the gradient, scales exactly like epsilon. So this fixes the scaling of derivatives acting on psi of pf in the direction of the Fermi velocity. But you could ask, uh, what about uh, these components, OK? And uh, uh, so this was correspond to Fourier modes of psi of pf that have uh, uh, 
momenta perpendicular to the Fermi surface. And it turns out that in first approximation, these uh, 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 components of the momentum can always be redefined away. So let me show you that with a simple sketch. Okay, so let's say that this is the, uh, the Fermi momentum. And let's take uh, an excitation with small momentum K that has a component perpendicular to the Fermi surface and one parallel to the Fermi surface. Well, I can always trade this excitation here uh, and this for, a, for a different description of it, which correspond to having, starting from a different, slightly different label, and then adding only um, a component, uh, uh, a small momentum that is exactly perpendicular to the Fermi surface. So a, a more uh, formal way of saying that is that uh, there is a relation between uh, uh, psi of PF, so if I now Fourier transform, with a, a component of momentum parallel and one perpendicular to the Fermi surface, and fields with a different label, which only have perpendicular component momentum. Okay? So these are exactly the same excitations. And therefore, at, uh, uh, without loss of generality, I can always assume that uh, at lowest order, uh, my fields essentially do not have a, um, um, a, a parallel component of the momentum. So uh, what do we see? So we don't need to worry about how the parallel component of the momentum scale. We have seen that D scales like epsilon. Now, what about the measure of integration that appears in this action? Well, we can decompose that uh, um, in a hand wavy way, if you want, as uh, a part uh, of X that uh, is uh, perpendicular to the F and uh, two pieces that are parallel. So now, uh, sorry, sorry, this is perpendicular, not to the F, perpendicular to the Fermi surface, which means parallel to the F. Now, uh, so this first bit scales like uh, one over epsilon. This scales like one over epsilon. This doesn't scale, and therefore the whole measure scales like energy to the minus two. And uh, if, as usual, we demand that uh, the leading kinetic term uh, is a quantity of order one in our expansion parameter, this fixes the scaling of the field psi f to be epsilon to the one half. So uh, you can see right away that these scalings are very different from any other scaling we've seen uh, in the previous lectures. And in light of the scalings, you can ask, okay, what kind of uh, terms can I, uh, can I add to my Lagrangian? You could say, okay, let me ask the, maybe uh, a term that is uh, quadratic with a constant. This is certainly going to be relevant. And in fact, based on our power counting rules, is scale like epsilon to the minus one. So it becomes more and more relevant as small energy. But if you think about it, uh, uh, if you derive the dispersion relation for uh, uh, your particles by solving um, the equation of motion, this will give you a dispersion relation, which is of the form epsilon is Vf dot k plus delta. So what this delta would do is really add some finite energy gap to all your excitations. But this will simply mean that you are expanding around the wrong surface. Or in other words, that you could always, it means that you can always get rid of this constant by performing a rephasing of the Psi F and extracting another phase of the form of this form. So for this reason, we can always uh, get rid of this term, even if it's relevant and we're not going to consider it. 
Now, more interesting is the fact that uh, uh, unlike in vacuum, based on our counting, the, uh, power counting, there exist now quartic interactions that we can write down, which are marginal. Okay? This was not possible in vacuum, but at finite density it is. So um, I'm gonna, let's see, I'm gonna write them uh, this way. I'm really gonna be pedantic, okay? And I'm gonna spell out uh, uh, even the, the spinor indices now. Now these couplings can also depend on the PFIs, on all the four momenta. And then it varies under time translations uh, and, and the U1 symmetry requires us to have uh, two psi daggers and two psi. I'm gonna call the labels minus PF3, PF1, minus PF4, PF2. Okay, and uh, uh, this prime here in the sum over all the, uh, the labels, uh, sorry, I promised I was gonna add uh, the spinor indices, so let me add them. The sum, uh, the sort of the prime over uh, this summation refers to the fact that uh, only interactions between fields with labels such that all the PFs add up to zero um, are uh, compatible with uh, invariance under translations because uh, under special translations, each uh, field gets rephased like so. And if you want this field to drop out, sorry, these phases to drop out, that's gonna happen only if all the PFs add up to zero. Okay, so uh, now because the, uh, the measure of integration we saw scales like uh, epsilon squared and each of the psi scales like the square root of epsilon, this goes like epsilon squared. So this is indeed a marginal, uh, a marginal interaction. And uh, uh, now the fact that uh, the, all the labels must uh, add up to zero due to conservation of momentum, but that at the same time, these momenta are forced uh, to live on the Fermi surface. Uh, these two facts combined place uh, uh, lots of constraints on what types of interactions are allowed. And there are essentially two different, two possible uh, kinematic configurations that satisfy these two criteria. So let me draw the first one. Let's pick uh, PF1 and PF2 this way as two vectors on the Fermi surface. We can pick them any way we want. And let's say that uh, there is an angle theta between them. Okay. So now their sum looks like so. It's not going to be in general on the Fermi surface. Now, uh, PF3 and PF4 must be such that uh, when I add them up, I get a vector that is exactly equal and opposite to this long vector that I just drew which means that this must be PF3 plus PF4. And the only possibility, the only way to achieve that is that uh, um, these two vectors must lie on a cone, which is uh, opposite to the cone that I just drew, that has the same, uh, aperture, and the only thing that can differ is the relative orientation between the plane that contains PF1 and PF2 and the plane that contains PF3 and PF4. 
So this is really challenging my drawing abilities here. I hope that uh, um, this configuration is, uh, is, is clear. So this is also known as the zero sound channel. Um, I'm using this terminology following uh, a beautiful review by, by Schenker that I'm, I'm citing in the, in the notes. So you see this construction is perfectly well-defined, but it becomes singular when PF1 and PF2 uh, are equal and opposite, okay? in which case the other cone uh, is no longer well-defined. But when uh, PF1 and PF2 are equal and opposite, are back to back, then uh, their sum is zero, which means that PF3 and PF4 must also add up to zero. And so in general, are going to be, again, two back-to-back -back vectors, which can have any random orientation on the Fermi sphere. But due to isotropy, physics will only depend on uh, the angle, let me call it sigma, between uh, uh, say PF1 and PF3. So this other possibility, this other kinematical configuration is known as the uh, BCS channel. And you can think of this essentially as the two different kinds of uh, uh, quartic interactions, okay? Two different contractions of, of these possible labels that preserve all the symmetries. Similarly, uh, uh, okay, very good. So let me focus now on the uh, on the BCS channel. So the BCS channel, we said uh, uh, these uh, uh, allowed kinematic configurations can be described only by an angle, a single angle sigma that varies from zero to pi. Which is to say that uh, essentially these couplings that I wrote, uh, G, A, B, C, D, which depend on all momenta, in practice uh, are going to depend only on one angle. Because when we uh, impose invariant under rotations and we take all possible contractions, at the end of the day, the only arbitrary quantity uh, is going uh, to be sigma. It's going to be the angle. And uh, if I take these couplings that depend on an angle, it turns out that there are only two structures that I can write in terms of um, when it comes to the, the spinner in this is now. And one involves um, delta functions. Uh, and the other one involves, uh, okay, so maybe sigma was not the smartest letter to use. But the other ones involves uh, Pauli matrices, right? So this is an angle, and this is a Pauli matrix instead. Uh, and this would be a CD. Okay? So you can show that uh, any other matrix that you would write uh, give you an interaction that is equivalent uh, once you start uh, relabeling uh, the various fields. OK, so since sigma takes values between 0 and pi, we can uh, um, take a page from our favorite math method book and uh, expand each of these uh, G1 and G2 in uh, Legendre polynomials. And in doing so, what we're doing is we're trading now a coupling, which is a function of an angle for a collection of an infinite number of couplings that uh, um, now are constant. And so we are a little more at ease with those. Notice that uh, uh, this at face value seems to contradict one of the uh, 
standard laws of effective theories because uh, what I just showed you is that in this theory there appears to be an infinite number of constant Wilson coefficients that uh, 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 that are all marginal. Right? So they are all at the same order in uh, in our power counting expansion. But um, the reason why uh, people and even myself, we said you always have uh, to deal with a finite number of terms at any order in, in an expansion in, in the power counting is because normally you work uh, with a finite number of fields. Whereas here we have essentially traded, uh, um, uh, we are working with an infinite number of fields, this uh, size labeled by this momentum PF. Uh, and uh, once you start having an infinite number of fields, uh, it's no surprise that you can write effectively an infinite number of independent interactions among them. Okay. However, notice that uh, this doesn't mean that this theory is not predictive because uh, for any fix, uh, for any couplings with fixed uh, L, say, uh, this des describes interactions between fields and you can still uh, freely choose uh, the soft momentum of any of these fields, provided that the combination preserves uh, um, uh, preserve momentum, overall momentum. And so you can say perform a measurement uh, for uh, a given set of the soft momenta, and then measure the GI of L. This is a thought experiment if you want, but uh, uh, at least in principle, measure the GI of L, and then use it to make a prediction for uh, uh, that involves uh, uh, different uh, uh, configurations of soft momentum. Very good. So because these interactions are, are marginal, whether or not they end up being relevant or irrelevant at low energies uh, is a question that is postponed uh, to considering quantum corrections. And uh, so quantum corrections would give you an anomalous dimension that could push uh, these marginal couplings either way. And whenever some of these couplings actually end up being marginally relevant, uh, which means that uh, they become important at low energies, uh, interesting phenomena occur. So for example, uh, in the BCS channel, when the L equals zero, um, um, uh, uh, coupling becomes uh, uh, relevant, you have, uh, um, and you're talking about electrons, you have, uh, uh, this is the mechanism for standard uh, superconductivity. Whereas uh, uh, when the coupling that becomes relevant, marginally relevant is the L equal one, one then uh, you have phenomena such as uh, helium-3 uh, superfluidity, where the helium-3 atoms are fermions, but uh, they pair up at low energies and, and condense and give rise to superfluid. OK, so this is, uh, was a, a brief tour de force on, uh, on Fermi liquids. And uh, my main goal was just to show you that uh, the main ideas and concepts that we have introduced uh, uh, applied also beyond uh, uh, beyond particle physics. Before moving on to my second example, and maybe it's a good time to stop and see if there are more questions. Yes, there is a question from Francesca. She's asking, it looks to me like for the G, A, B, C, D coupling, you decompose the SO4 matrix in SU2 cross SU2. Am I wrong? Uh, so uh, let me make sure I understand because these uh, these indices uh, A B C D uh, are two spinner indices, right? So um, um, yeah, maybe I'm not sure I understand your uh, your uh, Francesca. Do you want to elaborate? Question? Maybe if you want to jump in, if you. If you don't mind. Yes. Mm, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, perfectly. Hi. Uh, hi. Um, just because um, 
and as to, um, a two uh, per two matrix can be written as a sum of the identity plus the poly matrices. And since you um, wrote these two terms, one with the identity and the other with the, the matrices, it, it looked like um, there is this kind of symmetry behind also because we are speaking about spheres and, uh, and rotations and it, it sounded familiar to me. So, um, yeah, no, I, I see what you mean. Um, yeah, it, it, that's possible. I, I haven't thought about it in those terms. Um, uh, so I understand it for a, from a much more pedantic viewpoint, the less inspired. So I will need to think a little more about it, but it, it might very well be. Thank uh, you. Might, yeah, yeah, thank you for your question, yeah. So there are no further questions for the moment, Ricardo. Okay. So then uh, let me switch gears. And uh, on the one hand, go back from having a finite density to the vacuum, but replace uh, the quartic self-interaction with uh, uh, a long range uh, electromagnetic interaction. And what we'll be interested in is uh, describing again a situation where the fermions interact via electromagnetism, but uh, um, they are non-relativistic. Okay. And this is uh, uh, an interesting uh, framework to use. For instance, uh, um, uh, the, this EFT that I'm going to write down, which is known as uh, non-relativistic QED or NRQED, uh, it's a convenient framework to use if you're interested in describing uh, bound states of particles uh, um, with equal mass, okay? So things like uh, positronium, for instance. Um, in bound states, the, the, the particles must be non-relativistic because uh, um, for electromagnetism, given that uh, uh, the strength of the coupling is, uh, is controlled by alpha and, and, and it's weak. Uh, by virial theorem, you can show that uh, uh, the, the, the velocity uh, of the particles in the bound state are related essentially to, to the strength of the coupling and therefore that uh, they must be small as well. So, uh, but, but as we will see in, in, in this example, implementing a, a consistent and correct power counting will require us to we require a lot of effort and uh, i'm keeping this example for uh, for the very end in this set of lectures just to show you uh well for several reasons but uh, mostly to show you that uh, compared to the standard vanilla toy model that we consider at the beginning uh, following the precept of effective theory sometimes can, uh, can be very painful. Okay? So this doesn't mean that it's not worth it. Usually it's, it's always, uh, it always pays off, but uh, uh, sometimes you need to go in with your eyes wide open knowing that uh, um, things might get, uh, might get quite complicated. Okay, okay so um, since Electromagnetism is uh, um, is weakly coupled. I will uh, uh, this will allow us to perform a matching calculation explicitly, perturbatively. And so let me uh, start from uh, directly from the relativistic Lagrangian for the Dirac spinner. The electromagnetism, and then I'm going to also add uh, um, explicitly the gauge fixing term because how exactly you implement uh, the, uh, the power counting depends a little bit on, on how you on how you fix the gauge yeah so uh, and to be even more precise i will uh, oh, sorry i will work in Feynman gauge which is i will set is I equal one. 
So if we're interested in an oral activistic limit, we can start by playing exactly the same game that we played uh, um, in vacuum with the cortex self interaction. The first step is we're going to rephase our field and extract uh, the fast phase that corresponds to the rest mass energy. Then we're going to break up uh, uh, psi tilde into a psi tilde plus and minus. We're going to integrate out psi tilde plus and trade psi tilde minus, which effectively only has uh, two independent components for um, uh, a two index, uh, uh, sorry, for a, um, a two component spin on. And if we break up a mu into the scalar potential and the vector potential, and uh, we expand uh, the resulting effective action at three level inverse power of m, as we did uh, in the case of our self interaction, in the, yeah, we find uh, the following IDT minus e pi plus d squared over 2m plus plus e over 2m v dotted with the Pauli matrix times psi minus one half d mu nu d mu nu plus of course as two of other operators uh, that are going to start at order one over m squared. So um, the capital D three vector, yeah, that I introduced here and has three components is nothing by but the special gradient combined with the vector potential. Uh, and uh, just one quick comment about this term. Right. This term is actually, uh, so first of all, as you can see, it breaks uh, spatial rotations acting on the magnetic field and uh, spin rotations acting on the Pauli matrix down to the diagonal component. So this is, uh, uh, um, shows explicitly that uh, uh, the, independent SU2 that you get for spin rotations at lowest order in one over M is actually an accidental symmetry. As soon as you start adding corrections, um, the, the real symmetry is really just a, a combination of spatial rotations and spin rotations. So moreover, the, this coupling is of the form mu dot B, where mu is uh, proportional to S and S is just uh, Psi dagger sigma psi. So uh, this is nothing but the usual coupling between uh, a magnetic field and some density of uh, uh, magnetic dipoles. So it's a very, very simple thing of interpretation. All right, so, so to obtain a, a well-defined power counting in the, in the first example that I gave, this is really all we needed to do, right? Just expanding inverse powers of M and that automatically gave us a well-defined expansion in powers of P over MC or V over C. And you can ask, uh, are we uh, so lucky also in this case? And it turns out that we are not. But, uh, okay, uh, I'm, I'm jumping the gun here. So uh, what is that potentially could go wrong here? Well, what could go wrong is the fact that gauge invariance forces d mu derivatives to appear together with a gauge field. And uh, we know how uh, the derivatives act. We think we know how the derivatives act on these uh, rephased fermion fields. It's something we derived last time, right? So um, they uh, scale like uh, um, um, mv squared and mv, the, the, the special momentum, times psi. 
So uh, exactly like the operator D that we introduced uh, at finite density had two pieces that scaled uh, um, exactly the same way, you might wanna ask here if the same happens uh, with the D and A. So how does A scale uh, with the power counting parameter V? Well, that is determined in turn by uh, knowing how derivatives are gonna act on A. Because if you know that, then you can look at the kinetic term and figure out how the fields must scale in order for the kinetic term to be a quantity of order one. Okay, so let's figure out what type of momenta and energies can uh, photons carry. And let me consider a simple diagram where a photon is exchanged and, and a photon is emitted. So just by simple conservation of energies, we said if this uh, external line corresponds to non-relativistic fermions, all of them, then uh, generically the momentum and energies that are exchanged by this internal line must also be of order mv squared and mv. However, uh, let's look now at uh, this uh, external photon line, okay? This external photon line must be on shell. And uh, by conservation of energy, this means that uh, both uh, the energy and the momentum must be of order mv squared. They could also be on shell if they were both of order mv, but because mv is larger than mv squared, you wouldn't have uh, enough energy to produce such a photon. So I'm, I'm working in units where C is equal to one now. Okay? So this indicates that uh, uh, depending on the role that the photon line is playing in a diagram, there can be, uh, there are two different kinematical uh, regimes that are interesting. One, where the energy is much, much softer than, uh, than the momentum. And that's what we call the, the potential region, because essentially if I uh, didn't consider the photon that is emitted, this diagram would describe at long distances the, uh, would give me the, the usual Coulomb potential between particles. And then there is this, uh, this other regime, which is known as the radiation regime, or also for reasons that will become more clear in a moment, the ultra soft uh, region. And uh, the existence of these two regions uh, would seem to point uh, towards the fact that uh, uh, we cannot uh, define a unique scaling for, uh, um, for the gauge field. Because now when we take the kinetic term for the gauge field uh, and we try to read off the scaling uh, of a mu, it is not clear which derivatives, how the derivative should scale. Should they in the potential region or in the radiation region? So, um, in fact, uh, the situation is even more complicated than that. And uh, the Potential and ultra soft regions are not even the only regions that are uh, relevant. There is one more. So let me, um, to, to discuss that, I'm gonna make a, a mini detour and uh, discuss the method of regions, which uh, when I first saw it is uh, something that blew my mind okay. and is uh, the so i'm going to show you a very simple example but it shows the the power of uh, dimensional regularization okay. so let me consider a, a, a simple 1d integral sorry integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity over dk 1 over k squared minus a squared plus i epsilon 1 over k squared minus p squared plus i epsilon. 
Right? So this looks very much like some, that, like the toy version of some loop integral, where these are two propagators essentially with masses A and B. And I'll be interested in a regime where A is much more than B, which is to say where the ratio between these two is a very small quantity. And let's say I want to calculate uh, the, this integral i in an expansion in powers of this small quantity. OK, so that's our goal. And to do that, we're going to try to make some, uh, some approximations. So the first approximation that we can make is say, look, most of the contribution to this integral are going to come in the regions uh, that are around the poles, because that's where the integrands become very large. So uh, a reasonable approximation might be to break up this integral into two pieces, one uh, uh, that involves the regions where k squared is approximate, is close to a squared, and one where k squared is of order b squared. And we're going to integrate this guy here. Okay. So now in each of these regions, because A and B are very widely separated, we can actually uh, approximate or expand in series one of the two propagators. So for instance, in the first region where K is of order A in, in, in that surrounding, we can expand the second propagator and be left with an integral in this region of 1 over k squared minus x squared plus i epsilon k to the 2n b to the 2n, usual binomial expansion. And then I have another term where, uh, uh, which comes from the integral in the other region where I'm expanding uh, the other um, uh, the other quote unquote propagators in powers of A over B over B, right? And so here, what I'm doing when I'm expanding in powers of K over B, I'm saying in the surroundings of uh, where K is of order A, K is going to have values that are much smaller than B, and therefore I can expand the second propagator. So. Um, up until now, I've been very sloppy about when I said we break up this integral into two regions. Uh, clearly, uh, the precise values you would expect are going to depend on exactly how you chop off uh, these uh, um, uh, in, uh, these integrals, the precise value of each of these integrals, right? And uh, um, so what I'm going to do here is going to be something uh, an, an approximation that at first sight might seem quite violent and, and very and, and not very well justified, which is that I will extend each of these two integrals over the entire real axis. And uh, at first one might think this is a very bad idea because uh, you expanded, or I expanded better, I expanded uh, the two propagators, assuming that k in one k was smaller than b, and in the other case was uh, uh, larger than A. And so uh, if now I integrate over all the real axis, it would appear that this, at some point, somewhere over the real axis, this approximation is going to break down. Not only that, but also you see that if I integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity, now because of these powers of K upstairs, my integrals are going to be UV divergent. Whereas I started from an integral here that uh, was perfectly uh, UV finite. Okay, nevertheless, let's, uh, uh, let's continue. Let's push forward. And uh, we know of one way of uh, dealing with uh, uh, UV divergences, which is to use dimensional regularization. And so that's what we're going to do. You can calculate uh, uh, these integrals uh, using dimensional regularization. And what you find is that uh, 
the term that I wrote down is equal to this. And the terms that I neglected here that uh, corresponded to the integral in the other region is equal to that. So that now, if we add up the two contributions, we get uh, the following result. And now the mind blowing thing, at least for me when I first saw it, is that this result is not just uh, uh, an accurate or a fairly good approximation of the full result, despite the fact that we made an approximation that seemed poorly justified. It is actually the exact result. And you can check that by performing, uh, uh, by exactly the, the, the by calculating the original integral using standard uh, contour techniques in the complex plane. Okay. So uh, what does this little example show us if we now think of these as being propagators of, uh, of uh, particles and, and loop integral? What this shows us is that uh, uh, the the, the relevant uh, kinematic regions correspond to the locations of uh, poles in the, uh, in the integrands, in the loop integrands. And uh, if you look at this loop integrand that uh, we wrote here, this essentially corresponds to um, a loop that involves one propagator of this form, and propagators of the form one over v squared, and then n uh, field insertions, um, vertex insertions of the form k squared. So if I were to draw it as a diagram, it would look something like this, and so on for n, right? And as you can imagine, the, the, the second piece that I didn't write down would have a very similar form, except that, uh, um, except that now I would have a propagator of the form one over a squared, and, uh, um, and there will be a propagator which is one over k squared minus v squared, and so on. Uh, no, sorry, the propagator would be one over k squared, not one over a squared. Right? So what uh, uh, this suggests is that uh, we can reproduce the full result if uh, we introduce a copy of each field in each relevant kinematic regime, and we add a bunch of, uh, um, uh, a bunch of uh, uh, insertions. Yeah, thank you, Rico. Um, I'm getting there. Um, okay, so this one is known as the method of regions. And even though here I summed the, the entire series uh, to give you confidence that uh, in this simple example, you actually this way you get the exact result. Uh, in practice, uh, this is helpful. It's a useful technique to use when you want to calculate uh, uh, things in an expansion uh, in, in series uh, of a small expansion parameter, like in this case was A over B. And in our case, uh, it would be v over c. Okay. So let's go back to non-relativistic QED. I mentioned that uh, there is one more uh, uh, relevant kinematic region that we should consider that is relevant precisely in the sense that uh, these two regions, k of order a and k of order b, were relevant in this simple example. Okay. They correspond to poles in some of the propagators in, in loop integrals. Okay. So let's consider this uh, one loop integral. And let's work for simplicity in a center of mass frame. This guy has energy e and momentum p. This has energy e and momentum minus p. This has energy, this photon, k naught, and momentum k. This has e minus k naught, p minus k. This has final energy e, e prime, 
this is P prime minus P prime. And so by conservation of energy momentum, this last photon must carry an energy E minus K naught minus C prime and a momentum P minus K minus P prime. So this means that uh, the propagator will take this form for the photon. And now you see E and E primes are non-relativistic energies of the fermions, and so they are of order mb squared. But this quantity here is going to be of order p and p prime, which is of order mv. So this propagator is going to have a pole when k naught is of order mv. Okay? That's what it takes for the first term in the propagator to approximately cancel out the second term. And so now this means that uh, we also have uh, one more regime that is relevant, the soft regime, where both energy and momenta are of order mv. And you can convince yourself that uh, if uh, k0 and k are of order mv, then also the energy and momentum carried by this internal Fermion line, uh, sorry, Fermion line are also of order mv. So this means that there are uh, this is a regime that is relevant not just for the fermions, but oh, not just for the gauge field, but also for the fermions. So inspired by our uh, little toy example with uh, an integral that depends on A and B, what we will do now is uh, break up Psi into two fields. Uh, a field uh, that corresponds to the soft region and a field that corresponds to the potential region. And A mu into a part that corresponds to the soft region, a part that corresponds to the potential region and a part that corresponds to the ultra soft region. Okay. So this is actually not uh, as crazy as it sounds. In the case of uh, Fermi liquids, we've actually traded one field Psi for a collection of in an infinite number of fields, uh, Psi PFs. Here I'm just proposing to trade, say, Psi for two fields or A mu for three fields. So if you swallowed the previous procedure, probably this one uh, should be even more palatable, if anything, okay? And the idea is that derivatives now, when they act on uh, the soft part of Psi, they're going to scale like mv mv on the potential part like uh, mv square mv and so on and so forth. Okay. So it turns out that to get an explicit uh, power counting, there is one more step that is needed. And that's because if you plug these expansions into the Lagrangian that I wrote before, in general, you're going to get interactions between fields that live in different regions, like potential, soft, and so on. As long as uh, the whole interaction is able to preserve momenta, these cross interactions can, can take place. And when that is the case, you may ask, how should we power count uh, D4x? At that point, it, it's not clear, right? Should we count it as if uh, the, the coordinates were in the soft region, the potential region, it's not clear. And so to avoid uh, eliminating this ambiguity, we can uh, extract uh, energy and momenta of order mv so that all the fields depend on uh, uh, momenta that only scale like the ultra soft momenta, mv squared. So for instance, for psi soft, we extract the full for momenta, again, with these rephasings. And we trade it for a field that now is labeled by a for momentum. For the field in the potential energy, in the potential region, sorry, we just extract a three momentum. And 
And the same is done for the gauge field in the soft, ultra soft, and potential regions. Okay. And so when you do that now, derivatives on any field are going to scale like, uh, let me call any field, uh, let's say for instance, P, S, tilde, P mu, are going to scale like mv squared, mv squared. And this is true for any field. So now there is no longer an ambiguity and you can figure out exactly how uh, d4x scales. Okay, So it's going to scale like v to the minus 8. So this was just to give you a flavor of how uh, a theory that at the very beginning seemed very uh, innocent, when you get down to it and you try to uh, expand it consistently in power of V, um, it requires quite, uh, quite a lot of work. Okay? Nevertheless, uh, this work uh, oftentimes is, is worth it and pays off. So for instance, the similar approach has been used over the last uh, 10, 15 years, um, to study classical bound states in gravity by taking general relativity and uh, uh, expanding it in powers of, uh, of U over C along the same uh, lines of what we did here for, for QED, um, except that there you're interested in classical bound state. And uh, the resulting effective theory is known as non-relativistic general relativity, NRGR. And, and this is a good framework to essentially perform calculations in a post-Newtonian expansion, so in powers of V over C, uh, by using not standard method of general relativity, but by using methods of particle physics, Feynman diagrams, and, and the like. Okay? Um, and, and so that's, that's uh, despite all these complications, that remains a, a convenient framework to these calculations. So I see I ran a little bit over time. Sorry about that, but I wanted to at least give you the punchline. So let me stop here. And uh, before I do that, uh, just uh, thank all of you for, uh, for attending and for asking so many good uh, and, and very stimulating questions. And uh, to all the organizers for giving me the opportunity to, to lecture. It's been a great fun for me. So thanks to all of you. Thank you very much, Ricardo. The, the fun for was ours. I... So let me just add a very, very quick comment. I was not aware of all these things of the method of regions. Uh, okay, my mind is blown too now. Okay. okay. So mission <laughs> accomplished, I think. <laughs> very, very nice, very, very nice. So we have a question from Francesca, who's uh, raising her hand. Francesca, please come forward. Yes, it is exactly about this uh, method of regions. And my mind is not exactly blown as yours because I cannot unsee a problem. Um, in your Taylor expansion in uh, in the one over k square minus b square. So first of all, uh, you did the expansion in the integral in the region k square similar a square, didn't you? Sorry, in which region? Uh, when k square is similar to a square. Yeah. So I I, uh, I wrote. Uh, sorry, I don't know why I unshared my screen. Maybe I should share it again. Um, yeah, so I wrote explicitly only one contribution, but uh, I added up two contributions, one that came from the region close to A squared and one that came to the region close to B squared. Yeah, so um, you are Taylor expanding the other contribution uh, in, a, in a place where key is very far from, from B. Yes. And so your Taylor expansion is, is not convergent. Exactly. So that's exactly why this is uh, mind blowing, right? So uh, in principle, <laughs> when we extend uh, this integral to the, the whole uh, real axis, we would have uh, no reason to trust uh, the approximation that we have made because very far away, it, it absolutely breaks down. Right, but uh, um, uh, nevertheless, at the end of the day, you find that you get the right result, provided you work in dimensional regularization. And the reason for that, which uh, perhaps I should have mentioned, is that uh, the region uh, in the integral where uh, 
you are where your approximation is poor, right? Because you cannot perform this Taylor expansion. Is a region of very large K, in which case, uh, you know, the the A scale in this case becomes negligible, and uh, your integral becomes uh, uh, doesn't contain any scale approximately. And as we know, dimensional regularization sets to zero integrals that don't have any scales in them. So because of that, it is true that we are making a very poor approximation at very large scale case, but in that region, the integral is approximately scales s and therefore contributes approximately zero in dimensional regularization. So that's why we can get by with such a poor looking approximation and get something at the end is correct. I hope, I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, uh, <laughs> probably my mind is blown too now. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, uh, uh, well, there are many thank yous uh, for you, Ricardo, in the chat, if later on you want to, to give it a look. Uh, we have a question from uh, Nehal, who's uh, who's asking if you could please suggest some reference from this from the method of regions, uh, and also if there is uh, any relation between this and the replica trick often employed in calculating uh, Raining entropy in CFTs. Um, yeah, I see what you mean. Um, if there is a connection, it must be very, very deep. It's not, uh, it's not obvious to me. Um, um, yeah, it's not obvious to me that, that, that there is a connection. I will need to think more about it. Um, I, I, I don't see it, uh, it doesn't seem obvious. But uh, um, instead, when it comes to references, uh, uh, there is uh, um, a few that comes to mind are, uh, one is the Tazi lectures by Ira Rothstein, uh, lectures on effective field theories, uh, which I think I'm citing uh, in the notes. And uh, also there are some, uh, for instance, this example that I gave, uh, I borrowed it from a paper by Grishammer. And uh, he has a, a bunch of papers in, uh, uh, in between, uh, you know, around 1998 and 97. Uh, and uh, so they're all very pedagogical. One of them contains this simple example. Um, and then, uh, um, but I should point out that most of the systematics of how to expand uh, um, theories involving gauge fields in powers of V over C has been worked out uh, uh, in the context of uh, non-relativistic QCD rather than QED, okay? Uh, and so, uh, which is a, a, um, an effective theory that you can use to describe bound states of uh, heavy quarks. So, uh, some of these papers by Grishammer actually, uh, in particular, are concerned with, with uh, NRQCD. So instead of having a photon, it, it has a gluons, but the, the spirit is, is the same, right? And then I think the last reference is also the, some uh, uh, Lesouche lecture notes by um, Anish Manohar. I think he also has a section on, on the method of regions with a different example compared to the one I gave. Okay, so it seems that there are no further questions. So I think this is a good moment to close uh, the first week of the school. So Ricardo. Once more, thank you very much for accepting to give thank the you. lectures. And thank you very much. It was a really, really nice set of lectures. It's a pity that we couldn't uh, meet in person, but uh, hopefully soon, somewhere really in Trieste, really for example. So. I really yes. hope so. With you and with all the students as well. Yes. So if you all want to come to Sao Paulo or Trieste at a certain point, uh, just let us know. We will meet all there. Let me just, uh, before closing, uh, anticipating uh, what will happen next week. So next week uh, is, uh, um, it will be devoted to the most advanced part. And actually, we are going to, to bet a bit because we will have four core, four.